You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back. Welcome back, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you're tuned into the Questions for Corbett podcast series, where you send in the questions and I supply the answers. And as always, many different ways to get your questions in. If you are a Corbett Report member, log into the website and leave your question in the comment section of the previous edition of this series, or in the case of watching this one, leave it in the comment section at, at CorbettReport.com. Uh, if you're a non-member, you can uh, leave a question via the contact form, either type out your question, or you can record your own voice uh, using the SpeakPipe audio application. So the audio uh, could be featured in another, the future edition of this series. Or you can send in a video question via your favorite video sharing platform. Just send me the link. Or on Twitter. Uh, I usually recommend the QFC hashtag, but I now realize that that's a hashtag that's populated by garbage about some supermarket chain or something. So let's try Q4C, the number four, Q4C, as the new hashtag for this series. I actually haven't even checked if that is a hashtag for something. Let's hope not. Let's see if we can get uh, 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 our own hashtag going for this. All right, on on that note, uh, first of all, as always, thank you to all the participation from the Corporate Report members in the last edition of this series, uh, asking questions for this edition of the, the podcast. Also, um, leaving their own responses to the, some of the questions for you that I had in the end of last, uh, last month's episode, um, like, how did you wake up? Um, some very interesting responses uh, from people in the comment section. Also some resources for Ben, who was looking for some German language uh, truth websites. Uh, so lots of good participation there. Also some of uh, that phenomenon that I love to see with Corbett Report members interacting and answering each other's questions, like as an exchange, for example, between Mike E and uh, Buddha Force. Uh, speaking of which, Mike E had a different question that I'm going to answer here. Uh, why do people in a position and with a motive to expose 9-11 not do so? An example, I saw Muammar Gaddafi addressing the UN. I'm not sure how close it was to when we took him out. We. But lots of criticism about U.S. foreign policy. One was that we illegally invaded Iraq, which of course is true. But when he was saying that Iraq didn't have anything to do with it, he said it was bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and other things, to the point where he just related the official story. Doesn't it seem like he would have knowledge of the truth? And obviously he has motives uh, to at least insinuate some 9-11 truth. All right, thank you for the question, Mikey. Very interesting, very interesting question. And it's come up before in a couple of different contexts. But, I mean, for example, sometimes it actually does happen. For example, at the UN General Assembly, the same one that Gaddafi didn't uh, bring out the 9-11 truth card, guess who did? Mah uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, back in 2010, came out and said that most nations believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And just that was so outrageous that... We saw that spectacle of the United States representatives marching out of the room and all of their lackeys scrambling to, to get in their wake and march back uh, uh, back with them, um, Belgium and others. It's uh, a funny scene in some ways, I suppose. Um, but that's uh, it, how that type of situation would generally be treated. This man is insane. Uh, we don't even listen to what he's saying because it's just so insane what he's saying. And of course, that was the tenor of the headlines in the establishment establishment fake news media the next day. Ahmadinejad is barking mad and he's a lunatic and blah, blah, blah. So it really only served to further demonize Iran in the minds of, well, the uh, the fake news following West, uh, Westerners. So I'm not sure that really worked to any purpose for Ahmadinejad. But, um, but your general point is well taken. Most of the time, they don't. They don't bring it up. And why not? And a good specific example of that, we talked um, back in Interview 604 when we were talking to Sibel Edmonds. That was part three of the Gladio B series. We we're talking about that time Ayman al-Zawahiri in the mid-1990s was picked up by the FSB, the Russian FSB, and detained for six months where he had several fake passports and he had his doc uh, laptop full of these documents that were related to his operations that he was undergoing at that time with the U.S. and NATO in the Balkans, in, in the Caucasus. And the FSB, the official story is, they, they couldn't find anyone to translate these documents. And then they let him go six months later. They held Ayman al-Zawahiri, bin Laden's right-hand man, and probably the string puller, if you've watched my episode on Know Your Terrorists, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Uh, and 
Bah, they just let him go. So clearly the FSB, clearly Russia does know about the U.S.-NATO-Al-Qaeda collaboration. Um, and they do know, obviously, again, about 9-11 and things like that, as does every intelligence agency in the world, presumably, knows at least that 9-11 certainly isn't the way it's portrayed to the public. So why don't they come forward with this? I, I think there are a number of different explanations that we can look at, um, one of which is that it's a uh, it's a bargaining chip. Um, a lot of people have certain pieces of the puzzle that they could lay down on the table and expose a lot of things, and they know that the uh, the people that they're going to expose know that they know that information. So, <laughs> so it's that kind of uh, leverage. Uh, you know, you don't want to say that because I can show this. Uh, the flip side of that is. One reason why they might not play that card is because they themselves are blackmailable. It's a Mexican standoff situation, and every politician, every intelligence agency has their black operations and their dark dealings and things that they don't want exposed that other people know about. So, if you, oh yeah, okay, you're going to say tell the truth about that. We're going to tell the truth about this. Oh, you want to talk about 9-11? Well, we want to talk about the Moscow apartment bombings. You know, so there's, there's that aspect to it as well. Um... Uh, there's the, I mean, personally blackmailable people, um, you know, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, for example, just because it's in my mind with Lagarde going on right now, the trial we, we just talked about on New World Next Week, uh, he, uh, you know, obviously he has all sorts of skeletons in his closet, so they can just release uh, some of them when they need to take him down or set him up in a sting like apparently Sarkozy did um, back in the day. Um, the other possibility that springs to mind, they're in cahoots. And I think there's some aspect of that in all of this, because, again, clearly, I mean, it's a mafia game. And, of course, there really are divisions. There are different mobs or mafia bosses that want to be the Don, and they do struggle for, for dominance. They, they do jockey for position. They do rub each other out. They do try to take each other down. But they're not going to upset the apple cart itself. They don't want to completely upset everything, the, the order as it exists, because that's the order they're trying to take control of. So I think there has to be a, a strong degree of that. But again, different aspects of this play for different players in this game at different times, and we'd have to go on a case-by-case -case basis as to why X doesn't say Y about Z. Uh, you know. So that's the short answer. <laughs> that's that's part of an answer anyway. All right, let's move on to the next question. Again, from a Corbett Report member in the last edition of the series left this question. Boz says, a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of months now, uh, Sabella Edmonds and you talked about ties between Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini and Western deep states. Can you elaborate on the evolution of these ties after the Islamic Revolution? Did the revolution eventually have the intended outcome for the CIA and other like-minded like three-letter organizations? Or was the Islamist movement their best? Best option in something that was inevitable. Is this hidden hand something that still exists today or has existed anywhere during the post-revolution period? Source and literature recommendations also very much welcome. And thank you very much for that question, Boz. And uh, for people who don't know, yes, this is relating to a conversation I'll put in the show notes uh, for a couple of months ago between Sabel and I about uh, Iran and the, the U.S. deep state and the Islamic revolution. Um, but you're in luck. I have none other than Sabel Edmonds to help answer your question. Being outside Iran since 1982 and having read not as much as I used to read on Iran, I don't believe I can provide this 100% definitive expert answer. But uh, the, the, the timing of this question in a way is very interesting because currently Newsbud, I have a small team, we are working on this investigative story which has taken us back to Iran-Contra, which, which happened in the mid-80s. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and many people, at least I don't know if the person who asked this question is the, in the United States or not, but when the story broke and all these pieces got to be written here in the U.S., uh, they were really extremely sanitized. And so much still uh, is, is unknown to the public here in the United States. But we, for example, we got all the flight information. This is Santa Lucia Air. And, uh, and then we found uh, some of the airports here in the United States that were involved. Uh, these are the various hangars and the real arms dealers who basically do anything like mercenaries. But these flights, uh, they took off from the U U United States 
And the second stop for them was Belgium, and this is the heart of NATO, of course. And this is not in Brussels, but the Austin the airfield there. And from there, interestingly, these planes went to Israel, and a lot of weapons that were loaded there. Uh, to make the long, long the story short, the, the the people, the officials in Iran that worked very closely with the Americans and with the Israelis, okay, with the Israelis. A lot of them are still around. Like one key figure is Ayatollah Rafsanjani. And if you look at Ayatollah Rafsanjani's wealth and where he has been keeping this wealth, his wealth, they're not in Iran. They're not, you know, it's not residing somewhere in some bank in Iran in Iranian currency, which which is uh, which uh, based on the inflation rate they have, it just doesn't worth anything. But his accounts have always been in the United Kingdom. They've been in banks in London. Nobody has ever, you know, frozen. And it's not Switzerland. I mean, this is United Kingdom. Uh, and, and their kids, you know, as they finish high school, they send them to countries like the United Kingdom kingdom or Switzerland or the United States to get educated. So my uh, to to the to the best of my knowledge based on my previous, you know, uh, gathered information and from everything I have seen in the 80s, uh, I, I would answer that yes. Uh, there e it's very similar to places like Saudi Arabia. For example, when you look at these Saudi prince and kings and all the stuff, they are talking so tough about Israel, you know, uh, because, you know, they're Wahhabis and Israel is evil. That is to keep the people contained because that's what people want to hear there. You know, the same thing is true with, with Assad in Syria. Uh, after 9-11, when I was working uh, in the FBI, the most cooperative country in terms of feeding the FBI information was Bashar Assad. It was amazing. I mean, this guy went beyond of uh, even any pressure point to give the United States. But yet, when they go about rhetoric in their countries, same thing with Erdogan in Turkey and Israel, the rhetoric is, in especially Muslim countries, is to keep the public happy, contained, and pacified, you have to give them rhetoric that they want to hear. They want to see that you're anti-Israel and the great Satan, United States, and the Western, you know, capitalism. And But what they do in practice behind the scene is the same kind of diplomacy we are seeing all over the world, meaning, oh, absolutely, absolutely, they still have ties, they have negotiations, they have even commerce relations, you know. In fact, Israel profited so much more because Iranians said, even when I was in Iran, they said, we, we, we never going to import anything from Israel. It's like horrible Zionists, etc. So what was happening was, it was very interesting. Israel would send their eggs because Iran was importing eggs, okay, dairy, etc. from all over the world. They would send it to, let's say, a country like Turkey. And then from Turkey, it would go to Iran. So the consumer would be paying two and a half, three times the price. And the beneficiary, and of course, Turkey benefited too because they had their cuts, would be Israel. So they did engage in commerce with, with Israel. In, they just made it more expensive for the consumers in Iran. The same thing when the negotiations were on its way with OPEC deal and everything, behind the scene, a lot of cozy relationship, a lot of talk that happens. And in some cases, the United States blacklisting Iran makes the um, makes the regime, the current regime in Iran, even more popular and less. So, for example, James and I had this discussion that came up within the context of that discussion we had about Iran was, why in the world would the CIA release this document saying that Iran and U.S. had cozy relationship? The United States knows one of the fastest ways to get rid of the current regime in Iran is to start making public all the relationship it has with the mullahs. The mullahs will be, and there will be a revolution. There will be protests. So in some ways, the United States and the Western countries are also going with this tango by saying Iran is evil and its axis of evil. 
doing that, like what George W. Bush did, you know, the axis of evil, and one of them is Iran, would ground and, and, and make the popularity and ingrain the current regime, make it much more powerful. Same thing with the Saudi Arabia, you know. We can't United States because Saudi Arabia is U.S. puppet and it's an Israel puppet, but they have to maintain the appearances. And the appearances, maintenance is benefit to both sides, Western countries, Israel as well, and Iran. So my short answer would be, I suspect yes. Lots of, um, you know, ties in terms of uh, commerce, even weapon sales, you know, importing it into Iran, things with technology and also with the, you know, behind the scene diplom diplomacy. It is not this, oh, we don't talk to Iran or Iran says, oh, those evil satanic people. That's not the case. And if and when some revolution happens in Iran or a regime change or even if it happens, hopefully democratically. You're going to see if some of those people had to run, have to run away from Iran, they're not going to go to Cuba. They are not going to go to Saudi Arabia. You're going to see the same hotbeds. You're going to see London. You're going to see New York. You're going to see Miami. That's where their wealth is. That's where they're going to go. That's where they're going to be harbored. All right. Thank you for that question, Boz. And I think we'll leave that there. But let's move on to the next question again from another Corporate Report member in the comments section of the last edition of this series, this time Craig.j, who writes, question for Corbett. I am really confused by the climate debate. I understand the university types are only looking after their careers, and so dissent is virtually non-existent, but it's hard to believe so few have the balls to tell the truth. Is it because it's so hard to find evidence to refute, or what is it? Also, it troubles me that big losers in climate change is the fossil fuel industry, which have gone out of their way to obfuscate and derail climate research. Why would they spend billions on counter-propaganda if it were all a hoax? All right, thank you for the question, Craig. I think the vast majority of scientists generally, or scientific people who give their imprimatur, their stamp of uh, approval, to the climate change alarmism hype hysteria, uh, do so in basically ignorance of the details of that hysteria, the details of what it is they're giving their stamp to. And I say this advisedly um, because it is the story that you read time and time and time again from all sorts of scientists who eventually do start questioning that uh, climatic dogma. And when they start to arise from their slumbers and realize that they've been tricked, they're usually pretty mad about it. And there are many examples, one of which I'll point to you, uh, Judith Curry, who was presenting at the uh, Data or Dogma at the uh, at the U.S. Senate uh, late last year, where she gave her own testimony about how she came from being a blind believer in all things IPCC to someone who actually was looking into the science itself and finding, hey, wait, this isn't what they're saying. I thank the chairman and the ranking members for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Prior to 2009, I felt that supporting the IPCC consensus on climate change was a responsible thing to do. I bought into the argument, don't trust what one scientist says, trust what an international team of a thousand scientists has said after years of careful deliberation. That all changed for me in November 2009, following the leaked ClimateGate emails that illustrated the sausage making and even bullying that went into building the consensus. I started speaking out, saying that scientists needed to do better at making the data and supporting information publicly available, being more transparent about how they reach conclusions, doing a better job of assessing uncertainties, and actively engaging with scientists having minority perspectives. The response of my colleagues to this is summed up by the title of a 2010 article in the Scientific American, Climate Heretic Judith Curry Turns on Her Colleagues. I came to the growing realization that I had fallen into the trap of groupthink. I had accepted the consensus based on second order evidence, the assertion that a consensus existed. That's right, you will be called a heretic by this religious cult if you so much as dare to actually try to listen to some of the criticisms that have been labeled, uh, leveled at this, at this unquestionable religious uh, dogma. Uh, it's absolutely 
insane to think that a scientific community is acting this way. And where there's smoke, there's fire, as people like Judith Curry and many other uh, scientists have found when they've actually investigated this. So um, that explains, I think, a lot of the people on the very periphery of this issue, people who have credentials and are scientists in some field, who just understand, well, you know, obviously this is a scientific endeavor and, oh, it's the best peer-reviewed science, so it must be good, um, without looking into it themselves. But clearly there are people on the inside of this who are doing this work and who are engaged with this data and still um, believe. I think, again, I, th- I think for the most part, I-, I don't think there are very very many people who are involved in conscious manipulation, manipulative deception here. I think a lot of people really do believe it and they will do those kinds of ash conformity experiment pretzel twists to make themselves believe what they need to believe. Um, in part, as you already, I think, said in the question, because of their already pre-existing commitment to this, this is what their career, their reputation, their life's work is based on. Therefore, it must be true. Um, and there have been some startling examples of exactly that mentality that have been in plain black and white explained to us in so many words. And in fact, I'm writing an article right now about a scientist. One of his pieces of information was that the world's warmed by one degree Fahrenheit or 0.6 degrees Celsius in the last 130 years. Well, he's refusing to disclose how he came up with that number. And, I mean, I personally think that that's almost criminal. If you are, what, what are you hiding? If it's just numbers, what, what, what's the problem? And he actually wrote an email to Warwick Hughes, the Australian researcher, said, you know, how did you get this number? And he said, why should I share that with you? It took 25 years of my work, and all you want to do is find fault with it. That's a scary comment coming from a scientist. He's still blocking it, by the way. He, he's using the UK Met Office to claim that there's confidentiality. Yes, no, you can't make that up. That is an actual, real, direct quote from an email that was sent to Warwick Hughes on February 21st, 2005. Quote, we have 25 or so years invested in the work. Why should I make the data available to you when your aim is to try and find something wrong with it? End quote. Yes, a scientist said that. Not just any scientist. Want to guess who that was who wrote that email? Phil Jones of the Climactic Research Unit of the East Anglia University. Why does that ring? Oh, that's right, because a few years later, ClimateGate! (laughs) And we got to see the inside details of their uh, deliberations, including the fact that, yes, they literally broke the law in trying to hide this data from the public, and uh, the only reason they weren't prosecuted is because of statute of limitations. Um amazing, incredible stuff that's being done on the scientific side of things um, by people who not only should know better, but do know better and are doing it because they have 25 years invested in this work. Why should I make it available to you? So that's that's the scientific side of this. But the other side um, that you raise is the, is the big one because everyone will, or 99.9% of people, if you go out on the street and take a poll, will say, absolutely, yeah, of course. I mean, climate, there's climate science, and then there's this climate quackery of people who question that, um, who are all funded by big oil. I have yet to receive a paycheck, but anyway. Um, and, and that's, that, that's how it lines up. As, as, as you say in that question, Craig, billions are invested in this counter-propaganda. Actually, hmm, I might need a citation on that one. Um, it, 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 when you really start peeling back the, the layers of this, it's not very difficult, and you find it is the exact opposite of what we've been taught. Um, I'll throw in some links here. Here's a link to a long list of warmest art organizations. Scientists haul in huge money from big oil and heavy industry that mentions such things as the Climate Research Unit um, taking uh, money and grants uh, uh, from BP in their uh, Arctic Marginal Seas uh, Exploration Operations. Uh, The Sierra Club with um, taking money from uh, uh, Aubrey McClendon, CEO of Chesapeake Energy, uh, the Delhi Sustainable Research Development, getting money from Rockefeller Foundation and uh, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation of India, uh, the Berkeley Earth Sem- Surface Temperature Team, getting money from uh, the Cokes uh, and uh, the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation. 
uh, the 350.org, getting money from the Rockefeller Brothers funds, the University of, uh, uh, sorry, the Union of Concerned Scientists getting money from Chevron and uh, BP Amico and others, uh, uh, Climate Institute getting money from American Gas Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Shell Foundation. Uh, it, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, an, another one that came out recently was uh, a very interesting story uh, about inside climate news that was trying to spread this Exxon News uh, on new hashtag talking about a scandal that quickly imploded on itself um and uh, it they uh, they have t- deep ties to the rockefeller brothers fund including a publisher who uh, was a consultant for the rockefeller brothers fund but insisted they had no editorial ties to rockefeller rockefellers had nothing to do with what we- oh wait <laughs> rockefellers promised access to publisher of inside climate news emails show um the world Wild- wildlife uh, foundation uh, deep intimate historical ties to Shell Oil. Of course, WWF founded by Prince Bernhard of the Royal Dutch Shell family. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the Royal Dutch family. Um, uh, Etc. Et on and on and on and on. Uh, let's give it a specific example um, from an uh, article, There's Big Money in Global Warming Alarmism. Um, quote, yes, oil giants aren't foolish. They want to benefit and also don't want to suffer from the mania that surrounds all things climate change. Their activities are often mercenary. Oil companies will and do fund research that casts a bad light on coal, its main competitor, in hopes of lessening competition, but also in expectation of securing peace with activist groups. For instance, ExxonMobil uh, recently pledged to give Stanford University up to $100 million in grant money over 10 years to support climate and energy research. Um, etc. etc. Uh, Shell Oil since 1999 handed out 8.5 million in environmental grants. Like ExxonMobil, many grants flowed to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, but 1.2 million went to the Na- Nature Conservancy, Conservancy. The remainder was spread to several different environmentally minded groups. According to the Washington Brit- uh, Times, British Petroleum regularly gave to several environmental groups such as Nature Conservancy, Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund, the World Resources Institute, various branches of the Audubon Society, the Wildlife Habitat Council. It's important to understand that these groups accepted the money uh, BP gave them. The Washington Post confirms the Nature Conservancy par- pocketed over $10 million in cash and land contributed from BP and affiliated corporations. Joanne Nova has documented the massive amount of money pouring from government into the pockets of individuals and groups associated with the environment. The U.S. government alone has provided over $79 billion dollars since 1989 on policies related to climate change, including science and technology research, foreign aid, and tax breaks. Yes, 79 billion with a B. And again, that's really only scraping the top of the barrel of this barrel of scum of various groups that are pushing this and the the, the vast amounts of money that are pouring, sloshing through the uh, global system right now into this including money from the corporate oil giants. So uh, lots of links there to explore. Now here's the real question, and I think the question flips back. Why is it that everyone believes this line about big oil is funding all climate denial when big oil is demonstrably and on the record providing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to the climate alarmist scandal itself and not a peep in the media about that not a not a peep from the smog blog denouncing the pew research council because oh my god they're they're fun they're t- they take money from ga- uh, natural gas companies and things like this why why is that do you think hmm, maybe there's maybe there's a real question in there hmm? Anyway, so this is much, 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 much deeper and different than is ever presented in the establishment fake news. And again, I think there's a reason for that. Obviously, much more on this to come. Stay tuned. Uh, next, let's move along to another question from a Corbett Report member, Voice of Araby, who left this comment on the last edition of the series. Uh, it appears to me that the golden age of movies like 2001, Eyes Wide Shut, Being There, etc., etc., was between 1960 and 1990. Has that type of creative people, have those creative people stopped being able to produce such movies, or are they out there, but we have not figured them out yet? Or was it a generation of creative people that no longer exists? All right, thank you for the question, Voice of Araby. I get I get what you're articulating here. I think there's a few different factors that go into this. Um, one is that, uh, t- uh, to a certain extent, we, 
may have certain fondness for a certain era of media that we consumed at a certain age in our lives that, uh, I mean, everyone loves the band that they fell in love with when they were 15 years old or whatever and will till the, the, the day they die. And uh, most people, by the time they hit their 30s or 40s or 50s, stop listening to this newfangled music that's all just noise. It's not necessarily because objectively there is no such thing as good music or good movies anymore, to a certain extent. I mean, that is just the, uh, you know, our own biases. But I, I understand what you're saying. There are certain classic movies. And there really has been a shift in the medium uh, of mainstream blockbuster movies, certainly, from the time... Uh, that you, the time period you're talking about till the present, and that's demonstrable, that's obvious, you can put your finger on it, it's the fact that, you know, every single uh, movie in the top 30 grossing films or whatever is either a sequel or or a prequel or a, a, a spin-off or some sort of uh, remake or reboot or whatever they're calling it these days, or it's some, you know, big, silly blockbuster nonsense po- uh, popcorn fodder. Um, why why has it changed so dramatically, and why is there really very little uh, space for anything original in Hollywood anymore? Um, I'm sure there are a lot of nefarious reasons that we could come up with for that, but there are some just plain basic economic reasons for this, and one of them is the opening of China to Hollywood. Um, the fact that China is now uh, I think fast becoming the largest market, certainly the largest foreign market for Hollywood films, is changing what Hollywood is and the way it operates. Um, I'll throw in some links to some different story uh, stories on the web that talk about this. One from Investopedia, Why Hollywood Makes Bad, bad Movies. Uh, one from the Nanfang, uh, China Bristles, uh, being called uh, Rescuer of Hollywood Flops. <laughs> And one from Cracked.com, why uh, six ways China is changing, uh, China and Hollywood are teaming up to ruin movies. So um, this is a phenomenon that's been talked about. Uh, again, I don't think there's any, it's not like there's less creative people now than there were, were 50 years ago. Um, uh, it's just that there, those creative people aren't given the space to do this. And I've seen this mentioned in all sorts of interviews with independent filmmakers who will never, ever, ever get a kick at the can of some big $300 million Hollywood, you know, vehicle because, or even to get the space to have one of those, you know, $30 million movies that would have been made 20 or 30 years ago and would have done fairly well. Um, there's just not the economics behind it now. Now you've got to cater to um, the worldwide audience. You have to lowest common denominator, dumb it down and make it into something instantly recognizable. Hey, it's Marvel. Hey, it's, uh, you know, Star Wars. It's whatever. It's whatever the, uh, will get the most at the, the worldwide box office. All right, um, let's move on to uh, an open the mailbag from some questions that came in from outside. Um, We have a couple of questions, one from Gabriella. Uh, She writes, though the reasons behind things like the push for more and more vaccines, GMO food, and other atrocities are very clear, I can't help but wonder what people behind these schemes are thinking. Do they really think they can shield themselves from the negative consequences? How would they make themselves immune haha, to forced vaccinations, bribery maybe, or flying syringes? How would they protect themselves from any of the myriad potential disasters that could be brought about by synthetic biology, or from a potential global nuclear war? Would they seclude themselves in underground bunkers, move to Mars, upload their brilliant minds to a supercomputer, and merge with trillions of others to create a sort of heaven? Paraphrasing Nick Bostrom. Do they not care to sacrifice themselves in the name of what they view as something larger and worthy? Are they too stupid? Or maybe they're just uh, pretty pretty much regular people cogs in the wheel that's running amok and that seems unstoppable until it crushes against, against something and destroys itself. Any thoughts? <laughs> All right, Gabriella, this is an excellent question, and it's actually it's come up on before in this series. We've talked about it a couple of times, and uh, uh, for example, we were looking at uh, the uh, the leaked Guccifer images a while ago, ta- uh, looking at some of the I- images of the Rockefeller family in their home environs and looking at some of the beverages they were consuming. Um, so. I guess there's, a, uh, again, there's different ways to look at this. I mean, for one, we have to understand that the conspiracy, if there is the conspiracy, it is not monolithic. Um, it, it, there is not a singular group with a singular goal run by a singular person, all following a singular agenda that all know every part of that agenda and are following it in lockstep. 
No, I, I don't believe in that. I believe that there's different competing power structures that want that are jockeying for position, and they do. I think a lot of them share and the, the, converge on a, shaman, a common shared ideology of global global government. Ultimately, the, the creation of a global system that will be ruled from the top, the eyeball of the pyramid. But again, I think there's different people involved in that for different reasons at different levels. There's different strata here, different rings and rings, and some the rings interlock and some of them don't. And um, so different people have different perspectives on this. And I'm sure some of them are motivated simply by money. Uh, some of them are just in it for power or whatever, or whatever comes with that, or uh, some of it in, in it for completely different reasons. But um, I think, again, so keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that there are different people at different levels, we can clearly see that I think there are people involved in this who, uh, who don't, who genuinely do believe, again, what they're told about GMO food or whatever, whatever the case is, the vaccinations. Um, you'll see, I mean, we've talked about it before. Again, some you'll see a con congressional hearing on Capitol Hill and you'll see some Congress critter with their Diet Coke in front of them sipping from it. I, again, I don't think they know. I don't think they, they're they on that level of of understanding of what of this type of thing. So, um, so the, there's there's all sorts of people in the layers of this functioning of this this monstrosity that don't really understand what it is they're participating in, at least and not at all all of the different levels. And then we do know, for those who do, who are involved in the levels that they do know about things like this, we know that there are, there are get out of jail free license plates. Remember when that was revealed, where there are certain license plates, I believe in California, I'll put the link in the show notes so you can verify that, um, where if you have a certain license plate and the, uh, the cops run it through and they see, oh, this guy, you don't pull this guy over. Um, that really exists. That really exists. They really do have special different systems for that. There's VIP vaccination schedules for, for uh, you know, the very important politicians who we can't afford to actually be sick. They get their own doctors with their own health care. Remember back in the swine flu when uh, Chancellor Merkel and others were given special shots that, you know, because they're, they're special people. Um, you know, this isn't for you guys, you swine. Um, you talk about underground bunkers, kind of laughing about them, but they actually exist. There really are underground bunkers. We know this. Again, these are the things that we know really do exist. And these really are things that, that uh, ways that these, these uh, people who like to think of themselves as elite can get around the, uh, the obstacles that they put in our way, because of course this is not a fair playing field. So that really does exist. So again, I think there are a lot of people who are involved in the functioning of the apparatus of this machine that are being crushed by the machine and don't even know it. But there are other people in positions to know who got that sort of get out of jail free card in whatever sense that is, or at least they think they do. And maybe they're being played by people on, on, on higher levels of this game. Um, I think that exists as well. And so, you know, it's rings within rings. All right, let's move on to uh, another email question from Jill, who writes, are you concerned about being on the list as the powers that shouldn't be begin their crackdown on the web? What will you do if and when they try to censor your work? All right, excellent question. Um, this is, in a sense, a question I've been writing and talking about for years and years now in different forms. I've been talking about uh, you know, when and if this free and open internet as we know it today doesn't exist, what are you going to do? And uh, I, I, I am currently working on actual ways to make the corporate report at least more censorship resistant, hopefully, in the new year. But um, in the meantime, I think uh, uh, something that I've been propounding for years and years and years and years is when and if there is important information, you need a physical copy of it, a real tangible physical copy that you can hold in your hand and carry around um, of that information. That's um, one way that, you know, I mean, is it is censorable ultimately if they come and confiscate it, but it's much harder to do. I mean, with the, the, the web, it's a flick of the switch if you want to censor um, a piece of information or it's increasingly becoming that. Um, when it's actually physically printed, it's it's much harder and it involves physical destruction. So that is a good backup and something that we should all have of important information. So on that note, uh, I want to announce that from now until December 25th, until Christmas of 2016, uh, I'm going to be putting all of my data DVDs at 25% off 
And the for just as a reminder, the data DVDs represent for each year of the Corbett Report um, all of the podcasts, all of the interviews, all the videos, all the articles. Absolutely every piece of media that I put out in that year is on each disc. The caveat being I'm only up to 2011 so far. <laughs> so you, there's a 2007-2008 disc, there's a 2009 disc, a 2010 disc, and a 2011 disc. Um, from now until Christmas, every single one of those discs, 25% off. Just to use the uh, the coupon code uh, CHRISTMAS25 when you uh, are checking out in the in the DVD store on CorbettReport.com. So the link will be in uh, as, long, as well as the coupon code in the show notes for this so that you can get 25% off and get these because that really does represent entire years of this website and all of the work that went into that on these uh, data DVDs. And yes, I will be updating the series and releasing the rest next year. So that is part of the censorship resistance of the Corbett Report as we spring into operation here. But in the meantime, please do get those data DVDs. And let's start thinking of other ways that we can uh, become more censorship resistant. Again, I'm working on some other things, but um, we'll talk more on that later. All right, it is getting very late in Japan, as you may have noticed if you're watching the video version of this. So I'm going to start wrapping things up uh, at this point. Sorry for all of the people whose questions I didn't get to. But as always, let me throw a question back at you so that you guys have something to uh, to think about. Uh, I thought this was an interesting question I received from Robert, who wrote, If you were suddenly king of the planet, and you could wipe all current monetary systems, perpetrators, shenanigans, and attached att- appendages completely off the table, what would be the foundational premises that you would use to establish the most simple, workable, honest, and sustainable new monetary system? That's a very good question. I'm very interested in your answers. Have at it, folks. <laughs> All right. And finally, uh, in a tradition that we used to have way back on this uh, series, uh, I'm going to throw in a nice little uh, uh, email that I got that's the kind of thing that I love to hear and I love to share because it, uh, I think, shows the power of this this type of work and what it can accomplish. Uh, this is from Luke, who uh, emailed me a couple of days ago to say, I've been a huge fan of the Corporate Report for a couple of years now, and I just feel the need to tell you that you've inspired me to make my own media. I'm an 18-year-old senior in high school, and for the longest time, I had no clue what I wanted to do. From an early age, I always knew that I wanted to create things that other people could enjoy. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something unique and different. At first, I thought I wanted to be a novelist. Not long after that, I thought it might be the entertainment industry that was my calling. I went through a variety of phases, but none of them stuck. That is, until I found you and others in the alternative media. Almost instantly after discovering the message of liberty and learning the truth about history and world events, I knew I'd found my place. You've been my favorite source of both information and entertainment since I found you, and I realized I wanted to be to others what you've been to me. For the longest time, I would watch your videos and think how awesome it would be to make videos like yours. I would always make excuses and come up with reasons why I wasn't capable of doing so. Then I watched the podcast where you talk with Brock about making your own media. Suddenly, I realized that you guys are just normal guys who, like me who took it upon themselves to share with others what you've learned. I decided that I would quit making ex- excuses and go for it. I've been making videos for the past six months or so and really feel like I've found my purpose, as cliche as that sounds. I've made a lot of videos that I will never share, but had so much fun making them that I continue to do so. Through trial and error, I've seen my videos get gradually better and can only hope one day that I can make videos on par with yours. I just wanted to tell you that you've made a huge difference in my life and not just from an intellectual standpoint. Through watching your videos, I realized that I can, in fact, make videos and that I can make a difference. I hope one day I will influence someone the way you influenced me. All right, Luke. Thank you so much for that. That truly is the feedback that I I live for. I love to hear that because that's the exact kind of experience I had when I started encountering this information and I decided, well, I'm going to have to go out there and do it myself. So I'm just spreading it on. I'm just passing the torch. I'm glad to see a million people. I'd be ha- delighted to see a billion people take this up. And again, I know not everyone wants to do videos or you know make a blog or whatever, but just spreading the information, spreading the awareness, it, it really is, I mean, viral is the right term. Um, maybe it has some bad connotations, but the idea is there. It does spread, and it is it is the way that we're going to win this ultimately. It's, it's an ideological, 
it's a mind game that we're involved in and uh, we have to spread the awareness and spread understanding. So thank you for, uh, to Luke for doing that. I'm going to share uh, his YouTube channel in the show notes for this so that you can go and check out some of his videos. This is an 18 year old who's uh, been making videos for six months. I think he's doing an excellent job so far. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does in the future. So Luke, thank you very much for that. And thank you to all you out there for your participation, your support in all the various forms that it comes. I do appreciate it, and it does make this work uh, possible. So thank you all to all of you, and that's going to do it for me. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your questions for next time. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com, signing off. Now available from CorbettReport.com. The Data DVD, Volume 4. Every podcast, interview, episode, and article published on CorbettReport.com in 2011, all on two data DVDs. For details or to buy other Corbett Report DVDs, please go to CorbettReport.com slash shop.